Good afternoon. Uh, most of you know who I am. I'm Victor Bicard. Dean Michael Deli Carpini asked me to step in to introduce our special guest today. And it's my great pleasure and privilege to be able to welcome two longtime friends and mentors to Annenberg, uh, Robert McChesney and John Nichols. And as two of the nation's leading public intellectuals, they don't really need an introduction. So I'll keep this brief. I'll just mention a, a few words about them. Robert McChesney is the Gutzgel Professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He's the author of innumerable books, including The Recent Digital Disconnect, How Capitalism is Turning the Internet Against Democracy. And I should mention that my two political economy classes just finished reading this book. So Bob, if you'd like to quiz them during Q&A, <laughs> feel free to do so. John Nichols is the Washington, D.C. correspondent for The Nation magazine. He's also the associate editor for Cap the Capital Times newspaper in Madison, Wisconsin. He's frequently in the media. He's a longtime political blogger. You've probably seen him on MSNBC offering political analysis. John has also written far too many books for me to mention here. Uh, I'll mention one. He recently published a book called The Uprising, How Wisconsin Renewed the Politics of Protest from Madison to Wall Street. And together, McChesney and Nichols are kind of like the John Lennon and Paul McCartney of media criticism. They've worked together for many years. They co-founded the uh, leading media reform organization, Free Press, in 2002. They've published a bunch of books together, including The Death and Life of American Journalism. And most recently, they published this book right here, Dollarocracy. How the Money and Media Election Complex is Destroying America. It's on sale uh, right around the corner over there. Um, and this is the book I believe they'll be talking about today. So with that, I will hand it over. Please join me in welcoming Robert McChesney and John Nichols. Oh, thank you all very much. This ample loudness, wow. Uh, thank you, Victor, for the terrific introduction. Can we turn this down a little bit? I'm hearing reverb. Okay, is that the problem? All right. Yeah, that's better, yeah. Okay. Now I can hear myself, which is nice. Um, it's great to be here. Victor, of course, is my PhD student, so I'm very proud of him. and. Uh, Delighted to see how well he's doing. Glad he landed here at Annenberg, which I've long considered uh, really the gold standard for communication research. Those of you who are graduate students here are fortunate to be at such a great institution. Um, and uh, don't take it for granted. These things, uh, they're, they're scarce, and we have to protect them. Uh, so I'm here to talk about Dollarocracy, the book that John and I <coughs> just had published. And the place to start is to define Dollarocracy. What do we mean by that term? And this is really pretty simple. Democracy means the rule of the people, governance of the people. Dollarocracy means the governance of money. Instead of one person, one vote, you have one dollar, one vote. And in America today, uh, we are largely becoming a dollarocracy. Those with lots of money have lots of votes. Those with no money have no votes, effectively. Jimmy Carter, uh, over the summer, had a meeting with a bunch of German visitors, or maybe he was in Germany, but it was a private meeting with Germans. And uh, he was talking about the state of American politics and society. And he said that the United States today is no longer a functional democracy. It is no longer a functional democracy. It's off the grid of democratic nations. <clears throat> and I think the evidence is in that what Jimmy Carter uh, said is true. And most Americans get it. Most Americans are aware of this. So this is not necessarily the biggest news. Uh, within the past two years, two major teams of political scientists have published research which pretty much confirms the dollarocracy in place. They found that on most serious issues, significant issues of governance that the government handles in terms of budget, taxation, foreign policy, economics, regulation, the interests of the vast majority of Americans, their viewpoints, their concerns have absolutely no effect on legislators and regulators whatsoever. Uh, that it's really, you have to look primarily at those who are at the very top of the economic ladder or pyramid to see who influences and shapes uh, policies 
done by the government in the public name but without the public's informed consent. And as a result of this, what John and I talk about in this period of dollaracracies, you have a term that we've coined and we hope catches on called zombie ideas. And these are ideas that are routinely disliked by a significant percentage of the American people, if not a vast majority, but they never die because there's someone very, there are wealthy, powerful interests behind them. I'll give you a few examples of zombie ideas. Most Americans are keenly in favor of Social Security and Medicare. Uh, whenever they have a chance to express themselves on this issue, it's a no-brainer. They like Social Security, they like Medicare, they want to keep them. Yet, it's an issue that will not die. Because there are powerful interests constantly pushing the idea of getting rid, privatizing, scrapping Social Security and Medicare. And it will keep coming back. It never can be killed, apparently. It's a zombie idea. <clears throat> Most Americans dislike the idea of huge bailouts for banks or other forms of subsidies for giant corporations like energy corporations across the political spectrum. This is a real clunker issue. People don't like those subsidies, those bailouts for large corporations. But it's a zombie idea. Even though most Americans doesn't, don't like it, it always comes back because there's powerful interests behind it. That's dollarocracy. Uh, most Americans would like to have the minimum wage raised dramatically. They think it would be a really good thing that if someone works 40 hours a week, they should be able not to live in dire poverty. Uh, but that's, and most Americans across the political spectrum think that's a good idea. But that's an idea that is very difficult to latch on in Washington. It, the zombie idea is that minimum wage should be kept as low as, as possible, should not be raised. And oftentimes, most people, when they present this argument, <clears throat> talk about the Republicans as the party of big money, as the shameless advocates of, what, of corruption and the influence of big money, and the Democrats as sort of the feeble but well-intended opponents of, of big money. In our view, that really misrepresents the situation. Uh, the Democrats may not be as outwardly enthusiastic about dollarocracy, but they are the junior partners. Uh, they are part of the system. And to give one example, uh, that I, a recent example, it's not in the book, uh, uh, someone we know is in the U.S. Congress, a Democratic member of the Congress, and he was organizing a letter uh, to get members of the Congress to call for the House of Representatives to sort of evaluate the current trade deal that's being hammered out by the United States called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and say so there should be public participation in this. There should be study, debate, so Americans know what's in this treaty. And these are treaties like uh, NAFTA that are extremely popular with the entirety of the business class in this country because they're all about making it easier to move capital around, lessening government regulations, the ability of local governments to mess with you, uh, cutting into environmental and consumer safeguards. Very popular with them. The more people know about them, the less popular they tend to be with everyone else who are losing jobs and losing environmental and consumer safeguards, as a rule, as a generalization. And so this, prince, this petition that our friend was trying to pass around in the Congress just a few months ago simply said, not that we oppose the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but just that the American people ought to have a, we ought to discuss it so we know what's there, so people can see what we're signing away in this trade deal that's being rammed through. <clears throat> and our friend went to a member of Congress who's from a district that is one of your classic deindustrialized districts in Illinois, where it's, it looks like, you know, the Polish countryside in 1945. I mean, the, all the industrial jobs have been lost. She got elected basically by people upset about the loss of jobs. And she, he thought, boy, this, anyone's going to sign this Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's got to be her. This is the, the most important issue in her district. And, and he found out. He talked to her, and she said, well, I'll check and see. And she came back and said, I can't sign it. The head of fundraising for the Democratic Party said, if I sign this, it'll hurt the fundraising efforts for our mid-year elections next year. So I, I'm sorry, I have to regretfully decline. And that we would characterize as a good example of dollarocracy. That's how dollarocracy works. Money rules the board, basically, uh, both sides, and it controls and frames the debate. Now, dollarocracy has consequences. This is not an abstract argument. This is not an argument about uh, <coughs> um, that's sort of esoteric. It's sort of like watching a football match or something. This is our real consequences, what, what takes place. The results of dollarocracy are extreme inequality, growing poverty, uh, political corruption of uh, extraordinary magnitude, and perhaps most important, uh, economic stagnation, uh, and really a hopelessness uh, toward life as the system continues. And this is a particularly relevant to people uh, your age, the students here, people in their 20s, people younger. Uh, right now, probably we have the, I would say, 
most desperate moment for young people in this country and entering a labor market in many decades, probably going back to before the Second World War, and maybe even worse today than the 1930s for college graduates, because in 1930 there were a lot less college graduates and they could actually get jobs. Uh, today we have college graduates and they're desperate. They're living in their parents' basement, like my daughter did for a year when she finished college, my oldest daughter. <clears throat> so our book is about dollarocracy in the election system and how the election system has been brought fully into the sort of the new dollarocracy system. And elections are very important in democracy. They're something we study here in communication, they study politics, it's a central theme. And they're especially important in democratic theory because they're the one time in a society, no matter how unequal a society might be economically and socially, uh, they're the one time in which Bill Gates, the heirs to the Walmart fortune, and a hedge fund billionaire has the exact same amount of power as the person who cleans the latrine at Walmart or cleans the toilets from midnight to 7 a.m. And so they're the one truly egalitarian moment in a democratic society when the power is truly equal. And for that reason, they scare the death out of Bill Gates, the heirs to the Walmart fortune, uh, and hedge fund billionaires on Wall Street because they know there are very few of them. I've named about 10% of them, or about 1% of them. And there's very many of those other people and they don't like those numbers, and I don't blame them. You know, that, that's not a good situation for dollarocracy. And so what dollarocracy does is it's created a situation to make it easier for money to dominate the election system, to neutralize the difference in numbers. And another side of the coin, what it's done, is we've seen an extraordinary, and I think there's no other word for it, obscene effort to reduce voting rights for people in numerous states across the country, explicitly poor people, people of color, young people, people who are not considered to be sufficiently sympathetic to the needs of those with lots of money. So if we don't get let them vote and then let these people spend a fortune, that's dollarocracy. That's the sort of election system we get. <clears throat> the 2010 Citizens United decision by the U.S. Supreme Court is often held up as sort of the, what created dollarocracy, created this election system, but I think Larry Lessig had it right when he said that Citizens United fired a bullet into the body of democracy, but the body was already cold. I mean, the problems predated 2010. It wasn't like we were in some sort of nirvana prior to 2010. These are long-term problems. We chronicle them in the book going back uh, generations, but it accelerated in the past uh, 15 years. And what Citizens United did basically was it, it sort of crystallized and formalized, and it was a, a watershed moment, the sort of the new era that the Supreme Court and the dollarcrats have in mind. It allowed, in effect, unlimited spending on campaigns. And what it allowed too, although it doesn't call for this explicitly, but it allowed basically for unaccountable money. And what we saw in the 2012 election, we're going to see more and more, is that most of the money that's flooding campaigns now is not going directly to candidates, but is going to what are called third party groups, which have found ways to circumvent um, disclosure rules. And so we've discovered there's a web of Cayman Island drug dealer type money laundering going on. So we don't really know who's spending a lot of money in these campaigns. Uh, and that's the smart way to do it. If I was a billionaire trying to buy an election, I'd be doing the Cayman Island route too. I wouldn't be waving my hands, look at me. It makes perfect sense. Smart for them, not good for the rest of us. That's the crisis we face today. And what we have as a result in 2012, the, the election cost $10 billion. $10 billion. Uh, that's almost twice what we spent on elections in 2008. That's 10 times what we spent 20 years ago uh, on, on all elections. And you know, you say, oh, $10 billion, heck, that's just the cost of like, you know, blowing the crap out of some third world country for two weeks. You know, that's not much money. But $10 billion is real money. That's serious money. I mean, if you were to look at, you know, I just came back from Norway and Sweden. You know, Norway and Sweden, they spend in their national elections, they spend like, you know, $50,000. It's like, there's no political advertising. There's hardly any expenses at all. Uh, and their voters, they have an 80% voter turnout, not a 50% voter turnout. And no one's complaining there that, gee, I wish we could spend another $10 billion so we could have better elections. Uh, our money we spend doesn't improve our elections. It makes them far, far worse. And one of the reasons for this is that to the people, the dollarcrats, who provide the lion's share of the money now in our elections, you know, this isn't like probably most of you would think about a campaign contribution. I've given lots of campaign contributions in my life, and I give them to candidates who I think would be good in their office, I share their values, I like what they're talking about. You know, it's a civic contribution, that's how I view it. I don't think I'm gonna get anything back from it. When the dollarcrats make their donations, they're viewed purely as investments. They're not, they're not high-end consumer purchases, they're investments with a return. They're looking for something back. 
And it's not about values or civic virtue. It has nothing to do with that. This is flat out pure corruption. Now, most of the people who do this, we don't know who they are because they can work through this uh, labyrinth of Cayman Island type of money laundering that's been developed. But some of them are hot dogs. And so we learn from them, the ones who say, look at me, I'm giving the money. And hot dog number one in 2012 was Shelley Adelson of Las Vegas, who was proud to let everyone know that he had pulled out his checkbook and he was going to write all the checks he needed to write to hopefully win his elections. And Adelson was quite striking because he said, uh, after the election, he said, look, I'm for socialized medicine. I'm for gay marriage. I'm for stem cell research. I think we need really strong environmental regulation. I'm really concerned about all these things. But when I give money to candidates, I'm concerned with two issues. I want, I hate labor unions. I want to get rid of them. And I hate paying taxes. I want to make sure I don't have to pay any taxes. I don't, that's no fun. And that's who I'm investing in when I vote in candidates. You know, those other issues just don't matter. I'm investing for a return. I'm worth $30 billion now. This is not paraphrasing. I hope you'll forgive me. I want to be worth $60 billion in five or 10 years. That's why I'm willing to invest a few hundred million dollars to buy an election here or there. Uh, that's the way you think at that level. This isn't about civic virtue. Uh, as a result, Jimmy Carter has said that America has now the worst election system in the world. And to put that into even starker contrast, Jimmy Carter has for the last 25 years run something called the Carter Center. I suspect many of you are familiar with it. They've gone to 92 countries in the last quarter century to monitor elections to make sure they were fair, to make sure the votes were fair, to make sure they, the people in that country weren't having their elections ripped off or stolen or handled illegitimately. Carter has said that he could not monitor an American election because the United States elections don't even meet the baseline level of integrity he requires in the Ukraine and Belarus and other countries to go there. He wouldn't even do one of our elections. They would say, you've got to get your act together before we can even take your election seriously. That's what he said about our election system. Jimmy Carter, I can't think of a more astonishing critique than that. What we talk about in uh, dollarocracy, a great deal of our talks is that this is really a money issue, a media issue, excuse me. It's about the collapse of journalism. If we had great journalism that drew people into politics, that covered politics, that really made it live for all of us, the amount of money that's being spent wouldn't be that important. It wouldn't really matter how much Shelley Adelson wanted to pay, how many ads he wanted to buy. If we sort of Great, Shelley, we know what's going on. We don't need you. But part of the story here, a big part of it is that journalism, political journalism, but all journalism in America is in the process of free fall collapse. It's disintegrating before our eyes. Uh, we have today, and Philadelphia is a classic case of this. I'm willing to bet the Pew Center has actually done research on this. It ended in 2006, so I don't know what it would be in 2013 or 2014. But I'm willing to bet that there are probably 40% the number of working journalists in Philadelphia today as there were in 1988, if that. Uh, 40%. I mean, just the number of working journalists, the number of newsrooms, the number of people covering communities has plummeted, and it's still collapsing. And the sad truth is the commercial marketplace has given up on journalism. Uh, when Jeff Bezos can reach into his spare change jar uh, for $250 million to buy the Washington Post, that tells you that the the investors of the world have ruled journalism as a, cl a clunker. He got it for 5% of what it would have cost him seven or eight years ago, or 10 years ago, to get the Wall Washington Post. And he got it for that price because the investors of the world have determined that you can't make money doing journalism. And they're right. It's a rational decision that they've given up on journalism. They've given up on journalism because, for a number of reasons, but ultimately what it comes down to is it's been determined that there will never be advertising support for journalism online. That's impossible. And the reason for that is the emergence of smart advertising. When people buy ads online, they don't buy, go to a website and give a, a big pile of money to the New York Times website to reach the, whoever goes to the New York Times website, and then New York Times gets to keep some of that money to pay for journalists. Instead, basically, an advertiser goes to Microsoft or Google or AOL, one of the great advertising networks, and said, we want to reach 20 million women, 18 to 24, to sell our product. And they will find those 20 million women immediately in real time at whatever websites you go to because they know everywhere you go. And that's why they will always find you. And they don't have to give a cut to the New York Times then. They don't have to give a cut to any content producer. And because of that, commercial journalism is dead. The market has voted. It's over. Kaput. And that's a fundamental issue we talk about in the book and have talked about in our research. Fundamental political problem we have to solve in this country if we're going to live in anything remotely close to a democratic society. And it's an issue in which the dollarcrats are uniformly happy with the status quo. A rule without journalism is a world that makes them very happy. Now, 
where does most of this $10 billion go? Well, the majority of it goes to TV political advertising, campaign ads. There were twice as many television ads in 2012 as there were in 2008. Twice as many. We chronicle it in the book. You can't believe the numbers. You can't believe how many communities there would be like 25 or 30 candidate ads in a row uh, on a station. Uh, it is it's just extraordinary. And if, one of the things we discovered was that there's been an enormous shift in the nature of these ads. In the 1960s and 1970s, when people hated political ads, I mean, it was striking even then, there were hardly any by contemporary standards, most of the ads were positive ads. They were Richard Nixon throwing a frisbee to his dog or kissing his granddaughter or Jimmy Carter sticking his hand in the dirt in Georgia and feeling it and showing what a real regular guy was. Oh, they were positive. Was, you know, they were inane, they were stupid, they were meaningless, but they were positive. Now what we found is that the percentage of ads that are negative, that are attack ads, has gone from really single digits back then to around 50% by 2000 or so, to, depending on the race, anywhere from 75 to 100%. Uh, and, and there were some instances where it's really just 100% in races. It's all attack ads, all trashing the opponents. That's what we see uh, on, on our political culture. That's our, without journalism, that's our lingua franca. That's basically what we have to work with. And you know, th these negative ads really are quite different from commercial advertising. So all everything you know about commercial advertising, you say, well, it's just commercial advertising. It's okay for Pepsi and Coke. Why can't it be okay for candidates? You know, we could, you know, no problem there. But you know, commercial advertisers never do negative ads because it doesn't benefit Coke's advertising if you stop buying Pepsi. They don't make more money. It only benefits Coke if you buy Coke. So their advertising ultimately has to get you to buy Coke. If Coke runs ads saying, don't drink Pepsi because the workers, when no one's looking, urinate in the vat, well, no one doesn't necessarily buy Coke. Then Pepsi runs their campaign against Coke saying, well, don't buy Coke because they throw up in the vat. Well, it ends up no one buys cola drinks at all. So everyone loses. So that's just not a commercial option. There your job is basically get people to buy your product. And you hope they don't buy the competitor, but trashing the competitor, attacking them, isn't really a logical or rational policy. In political elections, it makes all the sense in the world. That's the key difference. It makes all the sense in the world for one reason. In a commercial marketplace, you have to actually have to someone buy your product. In a political marketplace, basically where it's a duopoly, if you can't get someone to vote for you, you get the same effect by getting someone not to vote for your opponent. One less vote for them is just as good as one more vote for you. And negative advertising works at getting people not to vote for the opponent. It's a wonderful thing to basically push down political interest, political involvement, and the voting rate. Now, people often say, well, everyone I know hates those ads. I hate those ads. And of course, everyone does hate those ads. They're insulting, they're demeaning, they're idiotic, they're moronic, they're stupid. There's nothing. People from other countries come and see our TV ads for elections, and they're baffled like they're some surreal, psychedelic nightmare. What do you do in this country? How can you watch this garbage and call this politics? And there's serious issues at play, and you're, reading, you're watching these inane ads. And they say, and most people say, you know, they can't possibly work. These guys are stupid. Why would anyone spend $6 billion on these moronic ads? What a waste of money. Well, actually, no, it's not that stupid. It makes perfect sense, especially when you have no journalism, a meaningful journalism covering almost all races in a country. For one thing, the difference between politics and commercial markets, again, for Pepsi or Coke, if Pepsi's got 49.8% of the market, it can be one of the five most profitable companies in the world. That's not bad. But who gets 40, your candidate gets 49.8% of the vote. They're out of business. They're broke. They're done. The difference between 50.1 and 49.8 is everything in politics. So you just have to basically nudge that up how, by any means necessary, and it's worth it, because all the chips are on that one number. Everything is winner take all. So that makes negative advertising effective, even if it doesn't appeal, affect everyone, but only 1% or 2% or 3% of the voters. The other point is that the research shows this stuff actually does work. Focus groups have been done for the last couple elections now with voters, and they'll talk to voters before an election. And the voters will all sit around, like I'm sure we all would, and say, I hate those negative ads. I never vote for anyone who doesn't want those negative ads. Those ads are stupid. I, I don't, can't believe those things work. And you know, I'm not going to even vote for someone who does those negative ads. I hate them so much. That's what people say in these focus groups. Oh, everyone. And then they come back and convene the same people after the election. They say, how did you vote? Why didn't you vote for that candidate? And invariably, people give the reason they don't vote for a candidate. They recite verbatim the content of negative ads against the candidate, the attack ads. That's all they know. Invariably, they do work. 
That's the secret. That's why $6 billion is spent on them. They actually do work to win elections. You can see when advertising is done, it can change poll numbers. When you stop advertising, your numbers decline. You see it in the daily tracking numbers. It works. It works, especially when there's no journalism and there's a lack of journalism. And as a result of this, <clears throat> we've seen corporate media as the main beneficiaries. That's who's soaking up all these ads. That's who's making all the money. The average local commercial television station in 1992 got between 2 and 3% of its revenues from these political advertisements by candidates. 2 or 3%, not bad. Easy money, you just collect, cash the checks and run the ads, it takes no work. In 2012, it's been going up every election basically in the last 20 years. In 2012, the average amount of revenue for commercial television station ranged from 20% to 40%, depending on the station, depending on the state. But it was enormous component of their revenues, of their profits. It is a crucial profit center. It's the difference between being wonderfully profitable or maybe losing money. It's everything for them. Uh, and it means that commercial, local commercial television stations, which are almost all owned disproportionately by about seven or eight companies, enormous companies, brand names you're all familiar with, have become the number one lobbying force against campaign finance reform of any kind. They are to changing our election system, the commercial media, uh, what the NRA is to efforts to stop, uh, to create assault uh, weapons bans. They, are, they steadfastly oppose it. And they've created a situation where it's virtually impossible uh, to engage in meaningful reform in Washington, D.C., and has been for two decades. To give an example of this, <clears throat> back in the 1990s, President Clinton's second uh, head of the Federal Communications Commission, William Kennard, when he came into office in 97, he decided to make his pet issue the idea that commercial broadcasters, uh, in exchange for the privileges they get with a monopoly license which, for which they pay the government nothing, should be required to give free airtime to candidates. So people wouldn't have to, candidates wouldn't have to rely on these ads and raising all this money, and they could have access to the public and the public airways, and airing candidate debates. So you could get to see and compare and contrast for all sorts of races in a district. And Kennard went around the country, and people were standing up and cheering. That was the greatest thing you'd ever heard, hoisting Kennard on their shoulders and carrying him around the room. They were so happy at the idea of getting rid of the inane political ads and having free candidate airtime and getting elections back to some sort of manageable level. Then Kennard went back to Washington, supercharged by the support he found around the country. And what Kennard discovered when he was in Washington that it was the exact opposite. Everywhere he turned, people had no interest in this whatsoever, both parties. Finally, some of the senior people in the Democratic Party who had worked at the FCC pulled Kennard aside. And they said, Kennard, if you keep the bill, they called him, they called him Kennard, said, Bill, if you keep this up, um, it will end your political career, and it will jeopardize funding for the SEC. You've got to drop this. This is not an issue we're allowed to talk about in Washington today. And Kennard dropped it for that reason. And I, I mean, he, I interviewed him on this very point. It was a, just astonishing. He said, it's, it's just absolutely tragic that the one thing in the laws that the courts have said, the first thing that commercial broadcasters should do to justify their getting these monopoly licenses from the government they get them at no charge. The one thing the, the courts have said, and the FCC said they should do, is cover local races with journalism. Give the voters information. That's the, only, that's the first charge they have to justify getting those licenses. And they do none of that. And when you raise that as an issue, even if they say we should address this, you're told the, their political power is so great you can't touch it. That's dollarocracy. That's it, inaction. That's the world you get when big money controls the board on that policy. And we see that across the board on policy after policy. <clears throat> Since then, um, it, it's only grown worse. No one's dared, even the most progressive members of the FCC, like our dear friend Michael Copps, who served for 10 years, uh, in the, for the last 10 years, 11 years in the FCC, never even tried to raise the issue. It's been understood it's a dead issue. You can't touch this powerhouse, despite the fact the problem growing vastly worse. Well then, fortunately though, right, we have the internet. Phew, solves everything. Now, no one's gonna sit through those stupid negative ads on the internet. I certainly wouldn't. Someone tries to show me one of those, and me, I'm going to smack my mouth so quick or hit my screen so quick, I'm going to do anything but watch a dumb negative ad. Of course, there are those ads that you can't skip through that they're coming up with. If you want to watch a video, you've got to sit through that stupid ad. Well, that's coming, but we'll, even then, I can look the other way. You know, I can cover my eyes or something, or hit another screen until I think it's over, or hit the mute button. So the Internet's going to solve our problem. And then they'll stop sending that money, we'll have real information, we'll all live happily ever, because after all, remember the internet is the place where we're all equal. We have control. 
The Internet's the place where we all can see all the information out there, and if someone's telling something here and something there, a candidate, we can see if they're lying. It's the world's biggest lie detector machine. It gives us the power. It's going to radically change the system. And the best part of all, and Americans love this, won't take any political work. The technology does all the work for us. We can sit back and let the technology make the revolution while we just drink our daiquiri. That's great. Well, unfortunately, it's not quite like that. Internet hasn't quite panned out the way the initial people thought it would. The power isn't with us, it's with them. And who's them? Them are uh, the handful of companies that have come to commercially dominate the Internet. And there are, oh well, uh, 15 of the 35 largest companies in America are Internet-related companies in terms of market value. 15 of the 35. And they are companies that most of them have, oh, you know their names, Google, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, AT&T, Verizon, Comcast, um, eBay. Most of them have monopolies in their core internet businesses that are equal to or greater than the monopoly John D. Rockefeller had with Standard Oil in the late 19th century. These are flat out monopolies. And they have the political power that goes with having that sort of power. They basically own the board in Washington. It's dollarocracy. And these guys have set their sights on taking over uh, getting the media and money, election conflicts, taking that, make that $10 billion, which will soon be 15 or 20 or 25, flow to them. Because that's great money. That's easy money. That's all profit. It takes no work. But they've got their eyes set on it. And what they've got to offer is that they change the way the Internet works. No longer are we all equal and anonymous and we can go where we want and we're in control. They're in control now because they know everything about us. Everything about us. They know where to reach us, how to find us, what works, appeals to us, what we buy, where we went shopping, who our friends are, what language appeals to us. They know all that about us. And they can create distinct messages for each of us. They can find you where you are and tell you exactly what they know will work with you best. And if it doesn't work, they'll refine it the next time. And they can do all this uh, by taking vast amounts of information, put it in the cloud, and then put supercomputers to work on it. And that's what they do. And there's, you know, you, everyone talks about how the NSA has done all this in conjunction with these companies, and it's true. But actually, you know who's going the very furthest in spying on Americans? Far further than, the, than even the NSA has gone. Far further than Google has gone, or Apple, or Amazon. You know who's gone the very farthest in American history to this date? The Obama campaign in 2012. The Obama campaign in 2012 dedicated several hundred million dollars hiring 2,000 computer scientists, the best brains in Silicon Valley, put up a whole office. They took all their data and put it on one cloud. Before it had been all these disparate data sets, they put it all together, and, they had, and then they put supercomputer applications to it, the best brains to it, and they had between 1,200 and 2,000 points of information on every voter or potential voter in America. And they could fire off emails to people, they had know just what language, what issues would work, how to get you out to vote. And I think most accounts now of the 2012 election say the Obama campaign had actually mastered it, better than anyone. They really took it further. And I think also we can see the future, and it's not a very bright one if we don't do something. Because what you're going to be able to have is a candidate, and, and you know the dark money guys have yet to get into this in a serious way. A candidate will be able to send a message to everyone in this room that will be tailored to you, exactly what issue would most appeal to you. They'll know, and they will tailor their message, and you'll be the only one who will get it. Wherever you go on the web, they'll find you, and you'll get that message. And it could be total BS. They could be basically telling you that they're pro-drilling, and they tell you they're pro-environment. Uh, they'll pick whatever issue they think will work with you. And there's no way you really have to necessarily figure all this stuff out. It'll all be confusing. There'll be very little accountability. There'll be no journalist around to check on it. Forget that. Journalists can't even check on negative ads on TV. Good luck checking 800,000 different emails, pal, if you can't do three ads on TV. Uh, it's a very disconcerting future. It's one that has flipped the internet on its head and turned it into the exact opposite of what the promise was supposed to be. Um, so that's pretty depressing, isn't it? If I bummed you all out, that was the idea. No, it wasn't. Actually, we're actually optimistic in the book. And John will talk a little bit about the politics. Well, the optimism comes from two sources. One, the reason why people are trying to make it possible to buy elections, make it possible to suppress the vote, is they know that dollarocracy could never survive a democratic review. That the vast majority of Americans have serious problems with the the type of society we're evolving into with the corruption, inequality, poverty, militarism, the lack of privacy. These are unsettling issues to the majority of Americans who would like them to be settled by their, uh, democratically, like to have policies that would actually debate and address these issues. So that gives us a lot of strength. 
If the American people were signed off on this, they wouldn't have to do dollarocracy. They'd win the elections, they could pocket the $10 billion or whatever they're gonna pay. They could let poor people vote because they wouldn't worry because they'd have enough other people to win the elections. Uh, so I'm, that gives us some of our confidence, uh, a lot of our confidence. And the other reason we're confident is that the sort of problems we have are simply not going to go away. They're not, you know, they, as I said before, you know, we've seen glimmers of up, outbursts in this country in the Occupy movement and the Wisconsin uprising. It's sort of faded. People say, oh, well, that was just a one-off. That won't happen again. But the sort of problems that led to that are only growing more severe, and, and they're going to eventually uh, be resolved. Our job is basically to make that transition one with the most democratic and humane outcome possible, the best possible outcome. There's, the crisis is here. It's how we're going to address it's really the issue. And I'll leave you with one last story that, that sort of explains my optimism. In 1988, I was finishing my PhD at the University of Washington in Seattle. And one of my professors was a white South African who had left South Africa in the early 1960s. And he was an opponent of apartheid. This was his entire family in Cape Town where he was from. And um, I went into his office to say goodbye. So I was packing up to go to Madison and he was very depressed. And I, I said, what, what's wrong, Tony? And he said, well, I've just been talking to my family in South Africa and all his family were anti-apartheid activists too and had been for decades, you know, forever. And he said, I've talked to my family and they said it's hopeless in South Africa. The forces for apartheid will never negotiate. They will never give up. There's going to have to be a bloodbath here uh, to have any justice for black Africans in this country. And for that reason, they're, they're leaving the country. And I, I agree with them. And my friend, I should add, was a, a student of South African politics who read their media voraciously. He knew South Africa better than anyone I knew. Uh, it was his area of concern. And in 1988, he was convinced it was hopeless that there could be peaceful social change in South Africa for the better. Well, for those of you not old enough to remember this, two years later, Nelson Mandela was released from Robben Island Prison. Five years later, he was president of South Africa. And there was less violence in that process than you'd find in a New Jersey bar fight on a Saturday night. Uh, it's extraordinary. And the reason I say this is that we can never predict the future. I mean, and people say, well, it looks bad now, so therefore the future is horrible. That's ridiculous. Before anything good happens, it always looks horrible, but that's dumb. You don't even waste your time. What we can do is look around and see this is not a tenable solution. This can't last forever. And we're in the middle of this. What can we do so that the solution is like the one they got in South Africa, not like one that could have been a lot worse like they feared? That's our job, and that's what we have to do now. Now, how do we actually do that? How do we think about that, imagine that process of change? How do we get an election system that truly is democratic and a governing system that's democratic? I'll leave that to the person I think knows more about American politics than anyone else, <laughs> John Nichols. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much for coming. I, I find this a very fascinating room. You know, it's a, it's a, uh, the wise can exit carefully from the back corners, but if you're foolish enough to sit up here, you are stuck with us. Um, and, and, and I, and I uh, invite the, those who must uh, go to go, but uh, it would be a terrible part, place at which to depart. Uh, it would be like seeing the movie where the, uh, the hero has you know gotten into that that corner where there really appears to be no way out. I mean it, it's and you know and the hero has his his daughter. Of course the, the mother's already dead. As in every movie, uh, it's always some guy with his you know and and there's no hope. There's no hope. Uh, and and before the the beautiful CIA agent who comes and the woman that then becomes the next mother. Uh, arrives, this woman sitting back here, she says, I know, that's every movie I ever watched. Um, uh, you know, you'd be cut off, you'd be ended, and so it's just a hero about to be done in with his daughter. And, um, and it's easy to think about the circumstance we live in, in that way, uh, because we watch so many movies. And also because I think that smart people in America, and I'll, I'll make the leap to suggest that, that Many of the folks who've gathered here are smart people in America. Like to think they live in the worst of all possible circumstances. That, that they have reasoned intellectually to an understanding 
that it could never have possibly been worse than this. And, oh, we know there were bad things in the past, but, but structurally now things are so awful, it's irredeemable. And we will have a, perhaps a distinguished academic career explaining that irredeemableness, um, but nothing will come of it. And the only problem with that is that it's every bit of history argues against it. Every bit of history argues that that is the wrong take, to think that you cannot fix the thing and that, in fact, it cannot become dramatically better is a wholly unrealistic and naive, uh, almost childlike response to the crisis. And you say, well, hold it, I've never thought, I, I thought cynicism was smart. Um, actually, no, it's actually, it's the best tool possible for controlling people. To make people believe they can't fix something is to win the fight. Because an irredeemable situation, a crisis you cannot get out of, that's, well, we're done there. If I'm the status quo, I've won. I thought one of the most fascinating things in America today is this suggestion that, that you know, billionaires are trying to fix the debt. Billionaires are trying to fix the problems in Washington. They're giving their money to fix the problems in Washington. After a period of the most radical redistribution of the wealth upward in the history of the world, where we have opened up an income inequality gap so wide that almost no one can leap it. And then you say, well, yeah, they would want to fix that. No, they wouldn't. This is fantastic for them. Gridlock is the dream come true. A Congress, a Washington that gets nothing done. Oh, no. Why, we're going to have to live like this forever. And if you happen to be a multi-billionaire, that isn't bad. If you happen to not be a multi-billionaire, if, you, if you're on the other side of that income inequality gap, trying to leap across it and seeing it widening and thinking, you know, man, I don't know if I'm going to be able to pole vault it, um, you might want to have a little hope. You might want to actually think the thing is fixable. And every book of any meaning tries to answer a question. The question will always be a different one. Uh, books structurally marshal facts to guide you to the question. And then ideally, they seek to answer it. The question of our book is not simply about money or media, not even really about politics. It is, how, how can we put up with this? How do we accept a circumstance where our democracy is so radically diminished, where polling shows, polling shows the average American would rather leave their child with a used car dealer than a member of Congress. I mean, just stunning. The numbers will blow your mind, the disregard for Congress. Polling shows that the American people believe, 56% of Americans state, bluntly, that they believe that their senator would sell them out for a small campaign contribution. I mean, that, imagine that. These are the people, you know, these are the heirs to, to Jefferson and Madison and Lincoln. And, and, and they believe, yeah, if somebody came up and offered them 20 bucks, they'd probably sell me out. I mean, the cynicism about our politics is rampant. And the only thing people hate more than their politics is essentially the media. And, you know, and it's like, when there's a car crash in America, it's a car with a bumper sticker that says, I don't believe the liberal media, uh, with a car that says, I hate the corporate media. And the two you know, people, no matter where you're left or right, your critique is the media is awful. So our politics is awful, our media is awful, and yet, can't do anything about it. What, what could we possibly do about it? Well, this is the interesting thing because we happen to be in Philadelphia, and Philadelphia is a city where, amazingly enough, historically, people have tried to do things about things. And, um, you know, a Declaration of Independence is an intriguing response to uh, imperialism, colonialism, mercantile class. And the interesting thing about the Declaration of Independence, an incredibly radical document, was it was written by a lot of people who didn't want to go to war. They didn't even want the American Revolution. They would have much preferred if the British just backed out. They had to, had to fight a little war there. But they were very tired of the fact that they lived in this place, and yet when the King of England got mad at his cousin in Germany, 
literally. Or when the king, somebody in France looked at the king of England wrong, they had to pay for a war. And the, they really started to get concerned. This is, you know, you think of all the noble reasons why America declared independence, where they really got concerned. If you look at the historical track record, and we talk about this in the book, where they really got concerned was when the King of England started offshoring wars. And you've sure heard of offshoring factories, offshoring jobs. The King of England offshored the French and Indian War to here. Literally, he's in a fight with the French, and we've got a war here because they didn't want to fight. It messes up cities and stuff. So you don't want to fight in London, so you move it over to the wilderness in America. And, you know, people, literally, people went out and said, wow, they're, they're now offshoring their wars to this place, much like Larry Summers, not to be the head of the Fed, said in the early 1990s that Africa was underpolluted, And so you should offshore your polluting industries to Africa. And, you know, it's sort of like, wow, there's another reason why, you know, if you have no other, if you have nothing to celebrate this week, just be glad Larry Summers is not going to be the head of the Fed. But, but the, the fact of the matter is that the people, they, 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 wow, wars are a really lousy thing. We would like not to have them fought. And you know what we think is the best way to stop wars? This is the best way to stop wars. Make it hard for kings and or presidents to launch them. And when they gathered here in Philadelphia to write a constitution back in 1787, one of the most critical things that they set out to do was to make sure that a president could never lead us into a war we didn't want to go into. And in fact, George Mason, one of the great authors of the Constitution, said, I am for clogging rather than facilitating war. The purpose of this document is to make it hard to go to war. So unlike in England, we didn't give a king or a president the power to go to war. We said, you got to go through Congress. And everybody knows Congress can't get anything done. And so it's going to be very, very hard to go to war. And this is a genius strategy. Make it complicated. If people really want to go to war. You know, you got World War II? Absolutely. You nail it, right? You know, next day, they're bombing Hawaii. Let's go to war. But if it's a stupid, stupid, irrelevant idea, if it's one that just cannot possibly work, if every if the four-year-old children say, I don't think that's a good one, you know, going through Congress might work. Genius idea. And you know what? Last two weeks it worked. This is an important thing to stop and understand. <laughs> We're not bombing Syria today because George Mason and James Madison, very imperfect guys, had a lot of flaws. But back in 1787, about 20 blocks down the street, they said, oh yeah, you got to get Congress is okay. Now, you know, a lot of presidents, George Bush didn't read that part of the Constitution, so it wasn't really relevant to him, but, um, but we elected a constitutional law professor, President of the United States. Has he done a good job of following that? No, he hasn't. Barack Obama has been very, very flawed. But an interesting thing happened. And this is relevant to everything we talk about as regards our book. In 2002, Dick Cheney went to a VFW event, Veterans of Foreign Wars, and he talked about how we're going to have to attack Iraq. And he did it in August. And Andrew Card, who was a big White House player, got really mad at Dick Cheney. He said, he said Dick, you don't rule, roll out new product in August. You know, if you're going to propose a war, you do it in September. And Cheney is like, oh, damn, I, I know that. I'm sorry, man. Well, in fact, the reason they don't roll wars out in August is because the members of Congress aren't in Washington in the middle of the money and media election complex. It is not rolling around them, feeding into them, going to fundraisers paid for by the military industrial complex of which Mr. Eisenhower reminded us, city of Washington and city of Wash, in, in campaign money that is given to candidates after it is given to the corporations and the CEOs of those corporations from the US Treasury. We give military contractors huge amounts of money, and then they take that money and they lobby for, well, what would you lobby for if you were a military contractor? I don't know, maybe things that involve 
your products. And so when you take members of Congress out of Washington, and then when you take them away from the punditocracy, which is a lot of people who used to have jobs, <laughs> and now they go on TV and they talk about, you know, boy, well, when I was in the White House, we just lobbed bombs, you know? Or as we had before the war in Iraq, a wonderful, those wonderful debates, I think you'll recall them, where you had, today we're gonna to explore on CNN the two sides of the debate about Iraq. This former general will discuss invading from the south, and this former general will discuss invading from the north. And no one there would say, well, maybe we shouldn't invade. And so Washington is a totally warped and dysfunctional place in which to govern America. And for most of the months of the year, that works very, very well for power. But in August, they all go on recess and they come back to their district. And that's why we're not bombing Syria today. Because members of Congress in August, when they rolled out this idea, say, well, maybe we're gonna have to throw some, lob some missiles at Syria. They were in their home districts talking to real people. And the real people are Americans, they're very humane. They said, hey, hold it, I hate chemical weapons. I don't want a world in which children are killed in, in distant lands. I am morally opposed to that. And it's, this is deep, hardwired. Don't, don't think for a second people don't care about that. But they also said, and you know what? We believe that the United Nations was created to do stuff about things like that, that the international community is supposed to respond to that. You don't just go and do it because that's what we did for 10 years. And 10 years of that didn't get us very far. Now our horrible media in this country, an indefensible media, says Americans are war weary, i.e. tired. You know, Americans love a war, but I'm really worn out today. Could we maybe do it next week, you know? Let me get a good night's rest. I think I'll be up for a war. Um, that is the most insulting thing possible because the American people can never learn. They can never ha evolve. Actually, quite the opposite. The American, American people are war weary. They are skeptical because they have had 10 years of information and evidence that some of these things just don't work. And so while Washington can never learn because it is slathered in money, which pays it not to learn, it's a very important thing. You people pay. You come here and you pay money to learn. You come here hopefully to improve. In Washington, money is paid at huge amounts to make sure people do not learn, that they do not improve, that they do not evolve. And so as a result, the thing that stopped us from having a war is that the members of Congress weren't in Washington. They were with the people. And they came back to Barack Obama and they said, this is a very big problem. Uh, they really don't want this thing. I'm not sure I'm going to vote with you, Mr. President. And Mr. President said, oh, geez, this is a serious problem. I need a lot of, uh, let's throw it to the Congress. And in that period, when it was in the Congress for you know, a couple weeks, a week and a half, slowed things down. It clogged rather than facilitated war, George Mason. And in that space, what happens when you clog rather than facilitate war? People look for other solutions. They do, in fact, care about the world. They do not want horrible things to happen. Wow, a space not for missiles, but for diplomacy opens. Things get solved. Problems get dealt with. We may not solve this problem. This, this could still go very, very bad. It's a tough moment. But the fact is, missiles aren't being lobbed today. We are trying to create an international solution that might just work. Exactly what the founders intended. We write about this a lot in the book. There are parts of our American experiment that are today working well. But here's the other thing the founders intended. And this is perhaps the most important thing. It's not, you'll never be taught this. You will never be taught this. The main thing that the founders wanted you to do was to be founders. Jefferson on his deathbed wrote a, a letter saying, I fear that the spirit of 76 is dying. What he meant by that is he feared that that high level of engagement where every citizen felt that it was their job to fix the thing, it was their job to make right the American experiment, was dying away, and that the thing that Jefferson said was the most dangerous thing that one generation could do to the next, the single most dangerous act of one generation to the next, not accumulating debt. I want to warn you on that one. Jefferson was very good at accumulating debt, and it didn't bother him a lot. No, 
It was saying to the next generation, the Constitution we have written is locked in stone. This document is sacred. It is biblical. It cannot be changed. You cannot alter it in any way. This is the original intent. It must not be touched. You must live like this forever. Jefferson said you would chain someone to the ideas of a time where you did not know things that you now know. You would be stuck in a past and unable to live in your modern times because you literally would be chained backward. Madison said, Madison said that it was the purpose of the Constitution to form an, a, a template which the people of the country generation by generation would fill in and alter to make right the American experiment. Genius strategy, right? Keep the parts that work, change the parts that don't. Now we live in a time where you say, oh my goodness, Mr. Nichols and Mr. McChesney have shown us a set of horrible problems in this country. Our politics isn't working. We have low turnout, huge amounts of money. Most Americans think that their Congress actually serves special interests, not them. Uh, we, have, we don't deal with fundamental problems. We've got all this bad stuff going on. Our media is collapsing. And of course, the, you know, we're Americans, so we can't do anything about it, right? Because we're locked in to who we are and how we do things. Jefferson and Madison, if they could crawl from those graves in Virginia, and grab hold of people and say, no, that's not how it works. The first 10 amendments to the Constitution were written and implemented by the people who wrote the Constitution. Four years after they wrote it, they said, oh, we got it wrong. We didn't put a Bill of Rights on. We got to fix this thing. Since the founding of the Republic, we've done 27 amendments to the Constitution. 27 times we have sought to make it better. We have sought to be founders, not merely to have been founded but to be founders ourselves. And the simple fact of the matter is we have reached another founding moment. Our founding moments come when there is a crisis sufficient that we must respond to it. And you don't sit back. I mean, you know, I suppose you can sit back. They say a third of the people during the American Revolution were Tories, another third you know, kept to their business, and only a third actually tried to fix the country. But I would imagine that the third who do try to fix the country go to Penn. And so you know, here you are, and you can either be disempowered and think there's nothing you can do, or you can go out and fix the thing because our Constitution needs to be amended. And we write about this at great length in our book. There's simply no question. When the Supreme Court of the United States repeatedly strikes down the reasonable laws to limit the buying of elections, that Supreme Court is dysfunctional. When that Supreme Court then at the same time makes it harder for people to vote, thus creating a circumstance in the United States of America where our highest court is making it easier to give money to buy elections, but harder for people to vote in those elections, that is the point at which the people intervene. It's a simple point. You step up and you say, well, obviously that there's a lack of clarity here, and the same lack of clarity on who would declare a war, right? We said that's going to go through Congress. We're going to clarify something else. No, money is not speech. Money is not speech. Corporations are not people. And the citizens of this republic have a right and a responsibility to amend their constitution to address that issue. Not a big deal. I'm sorry, not a big deal. This 27 times we've done it. We've done it. Look, we tried, we thought, well, you know, drinking's a bad thing, so we'll ban alcohol. That didn't work, so we undid it, right? The constitution is a work in progress. Anybody who tells you differently is in a fantasy world that is completely delinked from reality, or they are, in fact, serving those same interests that are so well served by gridlock. So let's, let's accept, as a basic premise, our Constitution needs to be amended. It needs to be amended in a couple other areas, too. We've got, look, the court shouldn't be mangling the Voting Rights Act. The Supreme Court of the United States, we shouldn't be waiting with bated breath to see whether it's going to be easy or hard to vote. This is an absurdity. This is an absurdity in the 21st century. Other countries don't do that. They would find that a, a madness. And so let us amend our Constitution to say that everyone has a right to vote and a right to have that vote counted. That right is not in the Constitution. In fact, when the Bush v. Gore case came to the Supreme Court, Antonin Scalia corrected a lawyer who mentioned the term right to vote. He said, there is no right to vote. There's no right to vote for president in the Constitution. That is not there. And I mean, it gives Scalia credit. He, A, is a good legal scholar. B, um, he doesn't mince words. But we need that so we can get done with some of these things. And the last thing we need to do, the last thing we need to do is eliminate the Electoral College. Because George Bush wasn't elected president of the United States. He lost by 540,000 votes in 2000. And yet he became president because of an archaic structure that doesn't work. 
That archaic structure that doesn't work was put into our Constitution at a time when only 6% of Americans could vote. We, at the founding, one of the biggest mistakes they made was to not let most people vote. And what did we do over the last 200 years? We said, you know, I don't know. I think maybe African-American men, after we fought a civil war, maybe we'll let them vote. And a while later, we thought, you know, you know, I, I am a little skeptical here, but thinking the women could do it too. And then we're like, then we really got radical and we said, we're going to allow Native Americans, the original people of the country, to vote, which came after they let women vote. And then finally, they said 18 to 21-year-olds can vote. And we've actually expanded this, the right to vote. We do it all the time. We amend the Constitution to expand the right to vote. Well, we're at a point now where we have this conflict. And our comfort level with repairing it is the issue. That's the question. Why don't we do things? I think it's because we don't know that we can. And it's time for us to reacquaint ourselves with our responsibilities as Americans. The last chapter of our book is really about this in great length, talking about what is up and how this happens. Well, one of the biggest challenges for reacquainting ourselves with these responsibilities are, are issues of education and issues of media. Intriguingly, we don't think that there is a need for constitutional amendments on education and media. The fact is, we think there are very easy structural changes that can and must be made in the moment. It is possible to fund a media that uh, works in this country. Massive public subsidies, yes. Pour a whole bunch of media money, pour a whole bunch of money into the media. You think, well, hold it, that, that's never been done. No. <laughs> the founders wrote a freedom of the press protection into the Constitution, and then they said, well, that would be meaningless. That would be a meaningless guarantee of a free press unless we made sure there was a free press. And so they poured massive public subsidies in the form of postal subsidies and actual direct subsidies. In some places, they would fund a pro-governing party publication and an anti-governing party publication. Same, so you'd have a debate. And they tried to foster a circumstance where there would be debate. You know some of the first African-American owned businesses in America that actually got government assistance were abolitionist newspapers owned by free, run by free slaves. I mean, that was, and, it's, and, you know, and you say to yourself, well, how could a country that allowed slavery fund abolitionist newspapers? Because it's exactly how we would do subsidies today. It is content neutral, right? The government doesn't decide who they go to. And perhaps we borrow models from Scandinavia where we would simply say that everybody ha gets, or Dean Baker's model, where everybody gets $100 that they can direct as a taxpayer to any not-for-profit media that you want. You can fund whatever you want. Uh, and you know what? Most other countries do do this. In some way or another, they make sure that their media functions. Not just public TV, but newspapers and other, other entities. They have multiple operations, multiple discourse. Here's what gets significant in this thing. And we study this a lot in the book. We measure America because we're patriots. We measure America against other countries. We want to be the best. We want to be the city on a hill. And you know what we find? We fell off the hill. The Economist magazine, not exactly some big radical publication. The Economist magazine does an Economist index democracies around the world. America has fallen to number 21. We're, we're working to catch up with countries that we used to laugh at. Now, I don't think we should have ever laughed at them because, in fact, they were still striving. We're not striving. As a country, we are not striving to be a functional democracy. And as a result, other countries are getting ahead of us. And it's not just that. Freedom House, another operation that rates, you know, rates press freedom, rates how all, all the inputs on democracy are. Freedom House says, we're collapsing down the list of countries with a free and functional press. The fact of the matter is, countries that take this stuff seriously make sure that their media works. And they also make sure that their small d democratic life works. And if you need to amend a constitution, you do it. You just do it and you don't, you don't get all fetishized about what was. You get comfortable with what should be. And you say, oh, I know, Mr. Nichols, that sounds just like the kind of stuff we hear all the time at lectures at Penn. You know, people come in, they say nice idealistic things and thoughtful things based with a lot of, but it's not possible. This has never happened. We've never been in a gilded age where wealth was so concentrated and where power was so, you know, really put in the hands of a handful of political and economic figures and then wrestled it from them and extended 
and remade our democracy. That has never happened in America, except 100 years ago. 100 years ago, if you looked out across this country, right, you woke up in 1910, said, well, what kind of country do I live in? I live in a country where little girls in mills in Pennsylvania and Massachusetts and New Jersey, six, seven-year-old girls don't go to school. They work as bobbin girls. They run in amidst the machines and change the bobbins of our textile machines. And the little girls do it because their fingers are tiny. They're useful in that regard. And also, if the machine's still running and it lops a finger or even a handoff, that's OK, because it's just a little girl. And they're expendable. They're not like the, the skilled workers that we have. And so little girls became tools of an industrializing country in 1910. If those girls made it through, if they made it through with their fingers and their hands intact, they still needed work, many of them immigrants, Jews, Italians, Irish, looking for work. African Americans coming north from a still segregated south, and they would get jobs in textile mills. They would make shirts and pants and clothing for this new expanding nation. And sometimes they'd work in a city like Philadelphia or New York on the 10th, 11th story of a mill, of a, of a factory. And when that factory caught on fire, they would run to the door and try to open the door to run to safety, and they'd find the door had been locked shut so that the women wouldn't go to the bathroom or wouldn't go to relieve themselves during their work hours, because they needed to only work when they were at work. And so those women went to the windows and dove to their death, 10, 11 stories, one after another, filling the streets around the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, because we had a government, we had a politics in a gilded age that didn't care about little girls and women. And those women were not even allowed to vote in our elections. They were denied the franchise. They could not vote for a better America. And even if they could vote for a better America, they were denied the right to elect their US senators. US senators were appointed, not elected. They were appointed in backroom deals. The people who owned the factories and locked the doors, the people who sent the little girls to lose their fingers, bought Senate seats in backroom deals and made sure that this country didn't pass child labor laws and laws to protect women in the workplace. And even if we did have a broader franchise and the ability to elect a government that might reflect us, that government had no power to tax corporations or the wealthy in any kind of meaningful way. We didn't have an internal revenue system. We didn't have a tax system in this country. That was 1910 in America, not Bangladesh. Not Bangladesh, America in 1910. In 1920, we had child labor laws in many states across this country, and evolving child labor laws nationally. We had protections for women in the workplace. We had a burgeoning labor movement in this country, not what it would become, but growing. We had the outlines of the New Deal coming into place, a radical transformation of this country. And interestingly enough, women were voting. And when they voted, in fact, in 1922, women were running for the United States Senate because we were electing our U.S. Senate. And when those senators went to Washington, they had control of the economic life of the republic. Not full control, not perhaps even sufficient in the eyes of some, but they were able to tax. They were able to tax the wealthy. They were able to put reasonable taxes on corporations. All of these things happened between 1910 and 1920 because we had an age of reform. We decided as a people that we would make that great leap forward, that we would indeed be founders again. And I will argue, we argue in the book, that that period from 1910 to 1920 is a founding moment of relevance, perhaps even comparable to the founding moment of the Republic. Because it was the moment when we really began to let more and more, not all people, but more and more people vote. We let half of our citizenry that were denied the franchise in, and at the same time, we gave them the power to do something with it. A radical transformation of this country 100 years ago. And I know, I understand, you say we could not possibly be the equals of our ancestors. That the history of humanity is one of devolution, and so certainly the people in this room could not repair things as garment workers, the parents of those children working in the mills, uneducated, often no schooling, immigrants who had to scrape, had to scrape through their days just to get by and yet would go to a meeting at 8, 9, or 10 o'clock at night to organize 
a movement for women's suffrage or for labor law changes or for a right to elect senators. We had an age of reform 100 years ago that transformed this nation. We had another age of reform from 1960 to 1970, beginning with a constitutional amendment to bar the poll tax. The end of the limit on people's voting based on their income and their wealth did not come in 1850. It came in 1962. That's when we barred the poll tax constitutionally in the United States. At a beginning of the decade where we passed a civil rights law, a, vote, a Voting Rights Act, Medicaid and Medicare, radical transformations of our economic life, a war on poverty, and we capped that decade by saying that the young men and young women who might be sent to fight in wars should be able to vote on whether to do those wars. We extended the franchise constitutionally to 18 to 21 year olds. Not in ancient history. In the lives of people in this room, we had an age of reform. And the question is, will we have another age of reform now? Because it is the only answer. Do not lie to yourselves and say that we can tinker around the edges of this system. We need constitutional changes. We need structural changes. We need radical changes. We need American changes. These are American fixes intended for America to implement. That's what the founders of this experiment wanted. And it's also what Martin Luther King Jr. wanted after the March on Washington in 1963. King celebrated the, the message of an end to discrimination. But it was the March on Washington for jobs and justice, right? and jobs and freedom. And so King said several years later that we must understand that simply giving somebody the right to sit at the lunch counter doesn't mean a whole lot if they can't buy a hamburger. We have to be serious about economics as well. We have to recognize the structural flaws. And King had a fabulous line when he launched the Poor People's Campaign shortly, just weeks before his death. He said, the time for timid supplications is finished. The time for begging before the altar of power is finished. We must make demands, as Frederick Douglass said, power never concedes without a demand. And King's legacy at the end of his life. We celebrate King so much, but we don't listen to him. He said there come points in the American journey when we must make our demand. Everything in our book argues that there is a crisis. But we're not upset by the fact of a crisis. We've had crises before. The only thing upsets, that upsets us is the suggestion that that crisis will not be met with an American response. And the American response is to amend our Constitution to say money is not speech, corporations are not people, and we, the people, have a right to regulate the money power so that our elections are free and open, so that everyone can vote, and so that the results of those elections are a reflection of our will, not the will of a moneyed elite. What we say is that America should not be a dollarocracy. It should be a democracy. Thank you.